Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. We welcome you to Sri Lanka's Economic Freedom Summit for the year 2024, which is conducted in collaboration with the Fraser Institute and based on their Economic Freedom of the World report. The main purpose of this summit is to improve Sri Lanka's country ranking on the report, oh, sorry, on the index, at which we are currently ranked 116 out of 165 countries. So through this summit, we hope to bring Sri Lanka to the next stage, improving both its ranking and so that its people will be wealthier and more prosperous. The summit will consist of three parts, uh, the breakfast forum at which we currently find ourselves, as well as an economic freedom audit, which will be, will be conducted right after this. Uh, we also have a concluding session in the evening. This year, the audit will be focusing on four main areas, namely tariff reforms, free movement of people, the digitization of courts, as well as the digitization of land registration. To open the summit, I would like to begin by inviting Dhananath Fernando, the Chief Executive Officer of Advocata Institute, to give the welcome speech. Thank you very much, Aisha. First of all, welcome all of you for the Economic Freedom Summit 2024. We are heading to a very important year, and we did the same summit in 2000. 1718, uh, and Fred was here uh, with many of our colleagues. We really wanted to push the reform process forward because we know what we have been going through. So thank you very much for joining hands with us for this effort. And all this effort is to improve the living standard of Sri Lankan people. And that's the main objective. And as we all know, the economy has to grow for us to overcome this crisis. And to grow the economy, the only solution is there's fundamental reforms which is holding us back, and we have to unleash that potential. And this is another effort that we are trying. We have invited senior decision makers and influential audience in the morning to discuss, and there will be breakout sessions, as Aisha mentioned, and we are drafting a set of reforms like we did last time, and there's massive impact from what we did last time, though the progress was slow. And then we are taking it to the policymakers and trying to get the reforms done on, the, on one side. On the other hand, in the evening, we are having a single event that's for a larger audience at the BMICH, basically to take the message why economic freedom is important for people of Sri Lanka and for their understanding, so then all will support the reform process so then we all can move forward. I'm not taking any time because there are very senior and knowledgeable people. I'll stop from there, but I mean it very sincerely. And thank you very much for all of you for joining this effort. And as it was said by Frederick Bastiat, when, when goods and services do not cross the borders, soldiers will. And that's what we want to stop. And that's, this is the effort that's ad, as Advocata that we are trying to push forward. Thank you very much and enjoy the sessions. Thank you, Dhananath. Um, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Um, he's indeed a familiar face to many of us, and he's widely credited as a pioneer in public-private partnership. Um, and Tilan Vijay Singh has over 26 years of experience in the field working, working here. Today, we invite him to share a few, sorry, a few words with us all, merging his many years of experience with this pertinent topic of economic freedom. Tilan. Thank you very much. I love short introductions. Uh, former minister, uh, Advocata's CEO, Dharanath, distinguished guests. When I was invited to speak today, obviously I was honored, and I thought of picking a topic that's pertinent to the subject matter being discussed today, and that's attracting FDI freedom to invest. And I thought, now I'm old enough, having done this business for 30 years, of promoting investments in this country, both domestic as well as internationally. Starting my entrepreneurial career as an investment banker in the early 90s, when I recall just about three weeks after the assassination of President Premadasa, we executed the uh, buy-side mandate of Transasia Hotel, Oberoi Hotel, uh, and then subsequently intercontinental to foreign investors. And then subsequently that resulted in my being invited to run the BOI, survived through several bomb blasts. Uh, nevertheless, 
uh, we continued to plug the country and then held an honorary position as chairman of the PPP agency, the first chairman of the newly constituted PPP agency. And today I'm back the last 12 years being an investment banker, working with, for example, Deloitte India, trying to privatize the Hyatt and Litro Gas. So I've been on both sides of the equation, running private sector corporates, as well as being in government to understand what it means to have freedom to invest. And to start with, first and foremost, we need to have sound macroeconomic management and not be a part yet again of this, what I call the unvirtuous cycle of going back and forth between IMF programs. So therefore, prudent economic management is an absolute sine qua non for investment promotion and attracting investment, and that goes hand in glove with policy consistency. Actually, the central theme for this speech, I thought I'll base on something that popped out of statistics when I was doing an analysis for a previous speech. I noticed that the period between 95 to 2000, it was a six year period, during which time I was a full-time employee of the government as chairman of the BOI, was the longest period Sri Lanka did not go under an IMF pro program. So I thought it might be permanent, per pertinent for me to go into a bit of history uh, because I had the privilege of being a part of a very erudite economic think tank and a team led by Mr. A.S. Jayavardhana as Secretary to the Treasury and later Governor of the Central Bank and Dr. Lal Jayavardhana who was economic advisor to the then President and the architect of the economic integration between India and Sri Lanka and uh, also the architect of engineering the Indo-Lanka Free Trade Agreement. So let's look at what went right because the second part of my speech will look at more recent trends in FDI and then I'll talk of the future at the end of my speech. Now, yes, the economy during that period grew at about 5.1%, which was higher than the uh, national average. And as you can see in this chart, now we have a situation where the wartime GDP growth rate on average was higher than the peacetime GDP growth rate. And then I thought I'll focus on 1997, when net FDI inflows, which in my view is the correct statistic to look at when we talk about FDI, net FDI inflow as a percentage of GDP reached an all-time high of 2.8% in 1997. Now, this is a number we should be consistently achieving because most some countries do 3, 4, 5% of GDP as, as net FDI inflows. Now, how did that happen? There was things that happened which I will highlight later that actually enhance a country's freedom to invest. And in particular, I want to highlight the five years between again 1995 and 2000 where we achieved an average equity FDI of $150 million. It was actually $155 million to be exact, which is 50% higher than the equity FDI of the post-war Sri Lanka era. Now, why is equity FDI important? Because that's what creates FDI stock in this country. That's where new projects come into the country, and that's through those new projects is where we have retained earnings being reinvested and expansions happening. So there was a greater degree of FDI stock being created prior to the, to, to the conflict than after the conflict. Now, and this is something that I wanted to sort of highlight to Harsha, uh, because one of your, I think, text messages talked of the fact that uh, Sri Lanka forgot export promotion after President Premadasa. I'd like to argue and say Sri Lanka forgot export promotion after President Chandrika, because in 2000, we achieved the highest ever level, and that was prior to the negative GDP growth in 2001, so it was, uh, the base was the correct base. We achieved the highest ever level of exports as a percentage of GDP of 39%, and it has gone down subsequently to 15.4%, and of course you see a slight spike coming, again because the base is going down due to negative GDP growth. Now, what did we do during that time, 96 to 2001? I'm willing to argue that the quality of wartime FDI, particularly when you consider export orientation was higher than post-war. 
Now, in terms of direct and indirect exports, that was a time where textured jersey set up in the Sitawaka zone. YKK of Japan set up a zipper, zipper and button manufacturing facility. They took six months to do their due diligence on Sri Lanka. Lodestar, Sri Lanka's largest rubber export company set up during that time in Midigama. Today it's Michelin. And between Mast Industries, Martin Trust, MAS, Brandix, at least 10 factories with more than $10 million of investment. And by, by the way, the cutoff point for this slide is more than $10 million being invested were set up during that, that time, all of which were export-oriented. Let's look at services. I remember taking Adrian Zaka, I didn't know who he was, the founder of Aman Resorts, at state expense on a chopper to show him lands for him to start his investment in Aman Resorts. Victoria Golf Course, I remember carrying a policy paper to Madam Chandrika Kumaratunga. The opening line of the policy paper was, Sri Lanka must be the only country in the world where for 110 years we have not opened a single new golf course. And that's how Victoria Golf Course started. Virtusa signed the BOI agreement in 1996. The rest is history. I personally went to Sweden to sign the BOI agreement for IFS software. Huge company today. And personally wrote the cabinet paper, got it approved through the cabinet to allow Millennium Information Technology, or MTI, which was subsequently owned by the London Stock Exchange, to build their campus in Malabe. Apollo Hospital was stuck for two years. We came up with a mechanism to make sure that that investment went through. And in infrastructure, SAGT, the first ever port terminal PPP in the whole of South Asia. AES Corporation, one of the biggest US companies invested in a 110 megawatt Kalinitisa project. Mitsui Power, KHD of Germany, Shell Terminals, who built a massive gas terminal in Kerala Pitya. Telia invested in Suntel and then subsequently in Mobitel. Transmarco invested in Lanka Bell and NTT bought SLT. And Hutchinson also set up a mobile operation. And then in non-export manufacturing, we had Holder Bank coming into cement, Hanjung into steel, and ETA, a large group in the Middle East, in the UAE, investing in Sri Lanka's second flour mill, Serendip flour mill. Now these are high quality, some of which are Fortune 500 company names. Now, how, was this hap how did this happen? There was a plan. Firstly, let's build industrial zones. We found that many companies were encountering many bottlenecks at the local government level when in the past the whole island was declared as a free trade zone because we found that the environment approval process, land, land process was quite cumbersome. So between 1997 and 2000, we built eight EPEZs, which are listed in red here, almost tripling the amount of industrial land available for investors, export-oriented investors to invest in. In Horana, we came up with a plan where next to the export processing zone, we'll have a power plant. And that's how the Aitken Spence power plant was built, where there would be a separate transmission line brought to the Horana EPZ where export-oriented companies would get preferential tariffs. Unfortunately, after my resignation in 2001, that was not implemented. Then, we provided infrastructure support to investors. As I mentioned earlier, Apollo Hospital and several other private hospitals, such as Asiri Surgical, were built, and we quadrupled the number of private hospital beds at that time, because BOI obtained a budget to provide the infrastructure to the periphery of the site. So the transformer, the sewage connection, the water connection up to the periphery of the site was paid to the line ministries or the local governments by the BOI through a special budget allocated to the BOI. This is what I call plug and play. Same thing happened when we implemented Nivasipura and Millennium City Aturugiriya, which to this date are the largest private housing schemes ever built, comprising more than 3,000 houses. When Virtusa signed their BOI agreement, Mr. Chris Kanagaratna said, Tilan, we don't have a place with high bandwidth. I went to my board and got, I can't remember the exact allocation, and gave a grant to the World Trade Center to lay a fiber optic cable from the top to the bottom of the World Trade Center, and that's why Virtusa started their business at the World Trade Center. We declared the whole of Malabe as an education and IT zone, and today you can see what has happened with, the, with Malabe working together with the UDA. Created SLIIT 
Today, with 22,000 students, the largest not-for-profit university in the country, bigger than Morotua, bigger than Colombo campus, accounting for 50% of IT graduates. How did it start? I went to my board and pleaded with the board to allocate 30 million rupees from the promotion budget of the BOI to provide grant funding to start SLIT. And then township development. We realized that the mature zones, such as Katunayak and Biagama, were bursting at the seams. So we got a budget from the treasury, built soccer fields, playing fields, up, up, upgraded hospitals, water supply schemes. Why? Because in order to create, cater to the migrant workforce that were occupying these areas. So, so that's pretty much the infrastructure action that we took. And what were the ad administrative action that we took in order to create freedom to invest? Amongst the top things that, in my view, allowed me to perform and the team to perform at the BOI was its board. I remember going to the former president six months into my tenure, saying, Madam, I can't work with the current board. She asked me why. I gave some reasons. And, said, and then she said, whom do you want? I said, I cannot run this organization unless the board becomes a policy-making board. I nominated three of the top secretaries at that time, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Industries, Secretary of Public Policy, and the former chairman of Eight Conspense, Michael Mack. The president immediately removed the board I inherited and appointed this board. That's the day I was able to get the support of the Treasury. And that has lessons that we can talk about later. And of course, then creating the PPP unit, the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment, through which PPP investments came about. And then, that was a time where the Public Enterprise Reform Commission that implemented privatizations was created. We also created what was then called the Private Sector Infrastructure Development Company, to which World Bank ADB gave long-term funding in order to support PPP projects with debt financing. SAGT borrowed from it, some of the power projects borrowed from the PSIDC, and that gave an, gave an impetus for the implementation of PPP projects. We attracted private sector professionals into government created interministerial facilitation committees chaired by myself, to which secretaries to ministries attended. Today, it's a struggle to have a secretary to a ministry to attend, attend, attend a particular meeting. Set up the research department, provided support towards the implementation of the Indolanka Free Trade Agreement. And there was something very important at that time that allowed us to succeed. We were able to market what I call the sanctity of the BOI Agreement. It is no longer that sanctimonious, I'm afraid, because at that time, there were no para-tariffs as we have it now, where a major portion of policy making was possible where you could waive, modify, and exempt the application of certain taxes via Schedule B of the BOI law. So even though excise duties and cessors were not part of Schedule B, there was sanctity of changes in law embedded in the BOI agreement. And then, of course, we did a process mapping in terms of how we fast-track investments. And I must tell you the record of us receiving an application, approving it, signing an agreement, renting an old building at the Katunayaka zone, and commencing commercial operation. So from application to commencing commercial operation, we did it in three weeks. Because this was a company that won a tender to manufacture tents for the Saudi Arabian government after a major fire. Uh, destroy the tents and dozens of people were killed. So he had very little time to actually manufacture these tents. So during the 95 to 2001 period, 750 new private projects were implemented. I'm not talking of signing agreements under Section 17 of the BOI law. And this was a doubling of the number of projects that were set up during the prior 17-year period. And that, I'm sorry if I'm sounding as if I'm bragging, but I have to give credit to the board, to, 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 to the team. But that's what allowed the team to win for the first time ever, to this date, international awards, where the BOI won the runner-up of the top national investment agency in Asia, awarded by Corporate Location Magazine. And by the same magazine, 21st best websites out of 500 investment promotion agencies. And I'm, I'm proud to say that the BOI was the first organization to actually have a website 
and have online applications in all of government agencies. Now let's look at the last 10 years. There has been a fundamental shift in the FDI mix, where 90% of FDIs reported over the last 10 years have been either debt or retained earnings reinvested. Now, retained earnings being reinvested is not necessarily a bad thing, and I'm not criticizing the definition of FDI. But if you look at the mix in terms of this particular slide, you can see that almost around 60% of all FDI that came into the country were in the non-tradable sector, such as real estate. Only 25% was, or 24% to be exact, was from the tradable manufacturing sector. And in these statistics are both export and non-export oriented uh, activities. So there's, there's no wonder that the export orientation of BUI approved companies, whether it's local or foreign known, deteriorated. In fact, it's important to note that in 2000, when I did an analysis, we found that 55 to 60% of exports from BOI companies arose from companies that had some quantum of foreign direct investment, either on a minority basis or a majority basis. Now, the next part of my presentation about investment incentives. Now, over the last 10 years, we saw the progression of gradually certain statutes being taken out of Schedule B of the BOI law, which made the BOI less BOI agreement less powerful in a way where you didn't, investors did not have the sanctity of future taxes impacting their business after they signed the BOI agreement. And we saw the advent of what is now called the Strategic Development Project Act, which on top of which certain new para tariffs and taxes were introduced. So whilst the BOI was weakened, the SDP Act allowed for the exemption of virtually every tax in the country but it was a non-transparent process of granting investment incentives, whereas the BOI law clearly spelled out the qualification criteria for you to qualify for an investment. There was actually only one criteria in the SDP Act, that is a minimum investment of so much. And for you to prove some nebulous concept of whether this is a strategic investment or not. Now, I'll actually go to the, this slide first. So you can see, uh, the SDP versus the BOI tax regime, uh, by the way, on the left side, it's supposed to be a tick mark, where virtually every tax under the sun, this is, by the way, 2018 statistics, um, the tax, tax rates might have changed, can be exempted under the SDP, but under the BOI regime, it's only one type of tax, which is customs duty. So, let's look at what happened with the SDP Act. So it was introduced as a panacea for attracting investment. 100% of investments over $100 million that commenced after 2009 has been under the SDP Act. Of the 25 or so SDP projects approved or implemented, not even one is export-oriented, manufacturing. 75% of SDP projects are non-tradable and are in real estate. 20%, thankfully, are in export of services, port terminals and the HCL software project. And only two foreign companies that started construction after January 2015 has invested over $100 million in Sri Lanka, Hambantota port and West Container Terminal. I could be wrong in this, but based on my research, it's a rather a sorry statistic at the end of the day. And if you exclude Hambantota as a one-off investment, 84% of FDI reported in 2017 originated from companies signing agreements prior to 2015. Sorry, I didn't have time to update this statistic, but what this says is that we have been primarily counting retained earnings and debt, foreign debt or debt taken by foreign loan companies as part of our FDI statistics. If you take even 2017, where $2.1 billion of FDI was reported, 80-some percent of that was retained earnings plus foreign debt and only a small component was equity. So that's the reality. Um, now, what are the deterrents? These deterrents remain even today. When you look at the investment criteria, the no-go, no-go, no-go decision is 
not made because of tax holidays or accelerated depreciation. It is because of para tariffs and upfront taxes. Now, when we did this statistic, Harsha, you were also part of a committee, we found that on manufacturing, the upfront taxes, before you earn $1 of revenue, is, was on fo at 14%, and on real estate, it was over 20%. So when you factor in these taxes on a real estate project, it had a 7 to 10% impact on project IRR, negative impact. So no wonder people are searching after SDP status. And I'm not singing the praise of SDP status here. Um, and of course, then when you factor in, at that time the income tax rate was 28%, but if you factor in 26% plus the dividend withhold in tax, it is not surprising that these taxes and the arbitrariness of the SDP Act has in fact caused a deterioration in investment. Now, the final part of my presentation is what is the right balance in formulating legislation and investment incentives to facilitate investment. Now the BOI argument would be, and I'm not necessarily agreeing with this fully, is that many a company, sorry these statistics are a bit hard to read but I'll explain it. The BOI has argued in this that out of 1,700 BOI companies that are in operational operations, almost 80% of them are paying taxes at the normal rate. So we give them the incentives, they set up operation, and after a while, they have to pay all of the normal taxes that are applicable in this country. Now, to some extent, I agree with it, but I disagree with the aggressive nature of which tax holidays were granted, particularly for projects where Sri Lanka is giving up something. For example, a port terminal. I saw no justification to give SAGT, CICT, or whoever a 20-year income tax holiday, especially when you make a 40% profit margin on it. But I was overruled by the Treasury. On top of granting a 20-year tax holiday, SAGT was granted, much to my shock when I read the budget of 1997 or 8, investment relief of one-third of the investment to be set off against the taxes of John Keels. No wonder that the tax-to-GDP ratio came down from about 18 to 90 percent, 19 percent that prevailed during the period I was chairman of BUI in the late 90s, to 11 percent, uh, Harsha, I believe. So, so there are arguments to be made pro and against incentives, but again, the question is what is the right balance? Now, let us look at the IMF Diagnostic Report on SDP. Now this is important when we plan for the future. To quote from Para 194, uh, the IMF report says, this is from September 2023, the Department of Fiscal Policy is a focal point in shaping the tax system, guiding the reform of most taxes, except for the special commodity levy, etc. So, so the brain trust for formulating tax policy is the Department of Fiscal Policy, great. There is no definition on what criteria needs to be satisfied for a project to be of strategic relevance. And the Department of Fiscal Policy is not involved in that particular evaluation. Agreed. To quote from Para 201, the SDP Act should be abolished or suspended until the structures and processes are in place to evaluate the effectiveness of offered incentives fully agreed. And it goes on to say that preparing the necessary structures, including data sharing protocol and legal documents and assign authority to the Department of Fiscal Policy will take time. And therefore, no further projects should be approved until then. And in conclusion, the IMF said, abolish or suspend the SDP Act until explicit criteria are established to evaluate all proposals, including the provision of public information on projected benefits and cost, and a transparent process is defined to apply the criteria. So the IMF has not shut the window for incentives. This is very clear language. The IMF is slapping us in the knuckles and saying be more transparent in the way you formulate investment incentives. Frame regulations so that investment criteria applies equally whether you are a local investor, a foreign investor, or a Fortune 500 company. Today, under the SDP Act, if I don't like A versus B, I can give more incentives to A and not B. So, so if you really, where do we go from here? 
I mean, I don't want to read this entire slide, but the poor FDI performance in manufacturing and the tradable sectors are in particular due to not enough trade agreements, line agency approvals, lack of coordination between the BOI, Treasury, etc. Then there are legal and regulatory issues, uh, infrastructure and labor, poor transport and social infrastructure uh, for mobility, um, lack of new industrial zone capacity with the required social infrastructure. Viagama zone does not have that. And for the last 20 years, we have not built a special economic zone with all of the social and industrial infrastructure. And many a study is done are gathering dust. There were some fantastic export strategies that were formulated during the Yahapalna government. What's happened to the implementation of these? There was a de-bureaucratization committee set up with top corporate leaders who were involved. Where is the execution? So here are some points for pondering in terms of what do we do about this. Firstly, let's recognize the importance of PPPs as a source of FDI. 40%, 44% to be exact, of FDI that came during the time I was chairman of the BOI was due to PPPs. And today, 75% of developing countries have central PPP units either under the finance ministry or the head of state. We've had a checkered record where PPP units were either under the BOI or under the finance ministry. I resigned as chairman of the PPP agency about two months after the election of President Gotabe Rajapaksa because I was told to do something that I did not agree with the then secretary of the president which was conveyed to me by the then Secretary of the Treasury. And then subsequently the PPP agency was shut down. 12 or 14 members of staff who were fully trained received termination notices. Some of them are part of my team now. Um, and we are exporting our PPP knowledge to other countries, Bangladesh and Maldives, and soon Nepal. And more importantly, more tragically I must say, $28 million of technical assistance donor money allocated to the PPP agency, money lying in bank accounts of Sri Lanka, adequate for a five-year PPP program, went back. And today we are stuck without that technical assistance. And it shows in statistics, we have not added to a new power plant for the last seven or eight years, a major power plant. I mean, there are smaller ones in, in, in hydros and mini hydros being implemented. So we will certainly face bottlenecks in power consumption. Now, sorry, this has got a little lumped here, this slide. Um, what are the suggestions going forward? Introduction of a new PPP law and update PPP guidelines this is being done. Uh, we facilitated the process. I, I have shared draft number 15 of the PPP guidelines that I did at the time I resigned, which did not get implemented due to bureaucratic bottlenecks. There's a PPP law being drafted today with assistance from a US donor agency. Rethink investment incentives with external specialists and in consultation with the finance ministry and IMF. We really need to do this. Introduce interim changes to the BOI law before an overarching new law. Now, I know an overarching new law is being contemplated. I'm of the view, let's tinker with the current law to have some immediate impacts, such as maybe the BOI board to be expanded to seven and have ex officio, at least at a minimum, a secretary of the treasury or a deputy secretary of the treasury within the BOI board along with the secretary industries, or the, give the BOI the ability to nominate or co-opt secretaries of line ministries such as environment or minerals so that the board becomes a policy-making body and not a, appoint board members at the whim and fancy of the minister in charge. So let's amend the law in terms of tinkering with the, rather than bringing an overarching new law by, by, by amending the current law. Relook at merging provisions of the SDP Act with the BOI law, Schedule B in particular. The BOI law to migrate to a special economic zone law, particularly to declare Hambantota and Trincomalee as uh, special economic zones because of the importance of social infrastructure. 
because we cannot rely on, entirely rely on local governments to provide the social infrastructure. And that's one reason why, as I mentioned earlier in Katunayak and Biagama, the BOI got money from the treasury and complemented the work of the local governments in upgrading the roads and the worker housing and, and, and social infrastructure such as playgrounds. Today, the Katunayaka cricket grounds is, is, a, is, a, is a division one cricket ground which was built by the BOI. Palla Calais Cricket Stadium was donated on my initiative to the cricket board carving out from the Palla Calais zone after we won the World Cup because the Candy Cricket Stadium was not up to scratch as a test venue. So we played up with a part in sports as well. Um, and consider through a new SEZ law, new types of special economic zones because yet the local governments and councils do not have the ability and the finances to support uh, large-scale investment, agri-zones, logistics, tourism special economic zones, such to include marinas and cruise terminals. And I must also add that special economic zones as PPP structures won't work unless there's considerable government financial support. We need to look at revamping the port city law. It is discriminatory against local investors. Then there's a need for greater coordination between the BOI, the PPP agency, State Enterprise Reform Unit, Port City Commission, and the Ministry of Finance. There should be board members who are represented, who are common within these uh, organizations because they have to work together and this, these boards must necessarily have both public sector and private sector professionals and, and individuals who, who are qualified. Enhance the infrastructure budgets, whether it's PPP agency or the BOI, for plug and play investments, the type I spoke about earlier. At the moment, when you want a power connection, the CEB charges you very arbitrarily in terms of your, 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 your power connections. These are services that must be provided by the government. And that's one reason why it's okay to charge, charge income taxes uh, from, from, from investors. Forge donor linkages for technical assistance in particular. And that, I must say, was one of the great facilitators to attract talent and capability was the USAID grant that we received in 1996 for PPP um, facilitation. Strengthen, strengthen research and processes to push through, to accelerate the ECTA with India and the China, China, FTA with China. I'm also an advocate of introducing anti-corruption provisions in all laws pertaining to investment and digitizing the investment approval process. It was unheard of in the 1990s about bribery impacting FDI. And I'm sorry to say today, it is a problem. Whether it is at the local government level or whether it is at the highest political levels. And finally, this is my final point, make public service attractive again for capable private sector individuals. I'm not saying that the public sector is without the requisite skills. I have learned tremendously from the knowledge of seasoned public sector officials. But often there is a need to attract private sector officials and it's that public-private partnership in people that I believe, whether it is in politics or whether it is in public service, that would take this country out of its current morass. And in this regard, I actually sent a policy paper across to the Presidential Secretariat on how we can define a criteria to attract private sector professionals where we would have it formally within the ARs and FRs approved by the Management Services Department and the Cabinet of Ministers, where we would define the re required skills precisely and narrowly so that in a given skill area, you don't attract more than 25 or 30 or 40 people. And, and this I wrote when I was told that Sri Lanka was finding it difficult to attract air traffic controllers to remain in the country because people are migrating or the private sector was taking them on at higher salaries. So therefore, I would advocate that this becomes part of the public sector process where appointments would be based on contract, performance-based contracts. And that's how we hired professionals in the past. One out of five people were fired by me for non-performance and of course to seek donor assistance where required. So in conclusion, moving forward, let us be transparent in FDI procurement 
And I believe that the potential to attract FDI in this country is in the billions, whether it is in agribusiness, ICT, tourism, renewable energy. We have 54 gigawatts of offshore wind potential, the World Bank so tells me. The mineral sector, which remains vastly untapped. We still, in 20 years, have not withdrawn the Supreme Court case stopping us exploiting the power of phosphate, and we can become self-sufficient in fertilizer and export fertilizer. But no minister or ministry has taken the matter before a full bench to withdraw what was a ridiculous judgment uh, in terms of uh, moving, moving ahead with uh, the power of phosphate project, titanium, etc. Natural gas, unbundling of the electricity sector creates massive FDI opportunities and investment opportunities. The SOE is being privatized. And very importantly, the recently signed India-Sri Lanka Economic Cooperation Pact which I see as a huge opportunity for attracting investments from our neighbors and brothers in the north. And for this to happen, the BOI, the SOIRUP, NAPPP agency, the Special Economic Zone Commissions have to work hand in glove and let us hope they would so that in the short term, Sri Lanka would have some quick wins without having to wait too long. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tilan. Your insight curated over the years is no doubt going to be invaluable to us, especially as we move into the audit. Uh, now I would like to introduce a very special guest. Joining us all the way from Canada, we have with us today Fred McMohan, a resident fellow of the Fraser Institute. Um, he is also a holder of the Dr. Michael A. Walker Chair in Economic Freedom, and he also manages the Economic Freedom of the World Project, while also coordinating the Economic Freedom, sorry, um, while also coordinating the Economic Freedom Network, uh, which is an international alliance of over 100 think tank partners in about 100 nations and territories. His research focuses on global issues such as development, trade, governance, and economic structure. Uh, and he's also an author of numerous research articles and books. I would now like to invite Fred to join us on stage to present some of his research on economic freedom. Well, thank you. It's a tremendous uh, honor uh, to uh, be here. Uh, as I was flying in, in the uh, last visit I had here, oddly enough, I was thinking of Taiwan in an odd sense. Taiwan's original name was uh, not original name, but it was for a while known as Formosa, which just means beautiful in Portuguese. And certainly, I have seldom seen a place as beautiful as Saralaika. You are all very lucky to live here. I'd like to thank so many people that are making uh, this possible. Dan and I had a nice conversation this morning over coffee and he briefed me on the situation uh, here. You are so very, very lucky to have a group like Advocata pushing for policies that will make Sri Lanka prosperous and reduce poverty. The potential of Sri Lanka is amazing. The situation where you are could create a, a global hub here that could spur development in incredible ways and reduce, per and reduce poverty. The problem is, as was just noted, so many policies stand in the way of Sri Lanka developing its potential and creating immensely better lives for its citizens. And I will be going through some of those barriers. In particular, we were just, the previous speaker was talking about foreign investment and foreign trade. Unfortunately, the government of Sri Lanka has put barriers between Sri Lanka business and the rest of the world, as we'll see, that is reducing prosperity and opportunity uh, here. So what I'm going to discuss is first, what is economic freedom? Secondly, why it's important? And then we'll look at Sri Lanka's record on economic freedom. Economic free, what is economic freedom? Individuals have economic freedom when 
properly, when property they acquire without the use of force, fraud, or theft is protected from physical invasions by other, and they are free to use, exchange, or give their property so long as their actions do not violate the identical rights of others. That's a complicated way of saying economic freedom is simply the ability of individuals and families to make their own economic decisions free of interference by government or powerful crony elites. We look at size of government and taxation. If government expropriates through taxation or other means, too much of your property reduces your economic freedom. Private property and the rule of law, this is the single most important area of economic freedom because without the rule of law, protecting the economic freedom of all, the rich and the powerful will take advantage of their positions to weaken the freedom and potential of others. And this also leads to corruption. A big problem in Sri Lanka, which I'll discuss later. Sound money. Boy, has Sri Lanka gone through problems with sound money over the last little while. Fortunately, things seem to uh, be getting better. Uh, but the loose and odd monetary policy that was adopted for a while here created great damage. Hopefully, it will never happen again. Trade regulations and tariffs. Sri Lanka doesn't just need Sri Lanka as its marketplace. It needs the world as its marketplace to grow prosperous. And as I mentioned, there are too many barriers cutting Sri Lanka off from the world. Regulation of business, labor, and capital markets. The opt zero is not the optimal level of regulation, but complicated, discretionary regulations are extremely destructive and feed corruption. As noted, a big problem in Sri Lanka. If your application, if your ability to go ahead is at the discretion of a civil servant or anyone else, then there's someone to pay off. But if you're free to do what you wish, if there's no one's permission to ask, if the laws are clear, then there's no one to pay off. They can't alter the laws because they're clear, and you're free to make your own decisions. Very different. If there's someone whose permission you need, there's someone to pay off. If you can go ahead under clear guidelines, then there's no one to pay off. Now the next is a little review of why economic freedom and free markets are so very important. I know there's a, uh, that there's some political parties in Sri Lanka that actually want to shut down even more free markets that may claim that they create great distress and poverty. So let's actually look at the history of free markets and what they accomplish. The age of global free trade, free markets, and economic freedom, beginning after the Second World War most, uh, in the most pronounced way, have brought huge benefits to humankind. But the gains were mostly achieved by those living in economically free nations. It is no accident. The globe is now in a crisis of migration, of people moving from state to state. And where are they moving from? They're moving from places with low levels of economic freedom to places with high levels of economic uh, freedom. So you hear from those who oppose free markets that free markets create nothing but poverty and misery. Well, look what's happened over the age of globalization and free trade following the Second World War. In 1950, three quarters of the world's population lived in desperate poverty. And despite a huge increase in the population, now less than one in 12 
live in extreme poverty. Free markets, the age of economic freedom, has not brought misery or poverty to those who have opened their markets. It has brought prosperity and reduced poverty. And where is that reduction the strongest? On the right side of your screen, it shows the level of poverty in the quarter least free nations. On the right, no, on the right side of your screen, it shows the reduction, it shows the least free nations, and on the left side of the screen, the most free nations. What do you see? Well, if the critics of free markets and economic freedom were correct, where would poverty be concentrated? It would be concentrated in nations that have economic freedom, that have free markets, if they created poverty. In fact, looking at the left side of your screen, extreme poverty has almost disappeared in nations with free markets. And if you look on the right side of your screen, you'll see that almost 30% of the population in nations without economic freedom live in extreme poverty. It's markets that reduce poverty, not government control. And here's another way to look at it. This is the income of the poorest 10% adjusted for purchasing power parity. And this is going to astonish some people, but the poorest 10% in the most economically free nations have an income of over 13,000 US dollars a year. So the poorest 10% in economically free nations, the poorest 10% earn two, three, four times the average income in Sri Lanka. And what in places that don't have free markets? In places like, which some politicians in this country want to impose on Sri Lanka, the average income of the poorest 10% is about $1,000 a year. Global per capita GDP has soared during the era of free trade and open markets. And again, the benefits are concentrated in the nations that have free markets. So the average income in the freest nations is nearly $50,000 US a year. In the least free nations, about a tenth of that. Literacy, it's the same story. Uh, again, critics claim that it's free markets that su suppress uh, education and opportunity. Well, during this time, we've gone from a world in which two-thirds of the population of the planet was illiterate to a time, despite huge population growth, where it's about one in eight people. That's still too much. And where do those one in eight illiterate people live? Unfortunately, in places that don't have free markets. So in the most free nations, 95% of the population is literate. In the least free nations, only about 60% of women and 75% of men are literate. One of the amazing things about nations with economic freedom is that the gap between men and women, boys and girls, has virtually disappeared. While in least free nations, that gap remains wide and dangerous and problematic for those nations. And that's because in a place where there's economic freedom, people get ahead by their abilities. And abilities include, of course, literacy for both. And, they get, and that's a, a key reason why economically free nations do much better in education. Life expectancy in years has grown immensely uh, over this period. And again, the uh, nations with the highest level of economic freedom 
have the longest lived people. And I'm awfully glad I was born in Canada, which is an economically free nation, because if you uh, look to your right, I've already surpassed the average age of people grow who live in non-economically free nations, so I'm grateful for that. And one last thing. Those who oppose free markets may have given up to some extent on the economic arguments. You know, they go, oh, well, maybe economically free nations or free markets produce more prosperity, but really who cares about prosperity? What we care about is happiness, and how can anybody be happy in a free market? Well, as it turns out, research by sociologists who are not known for their friendliness to uh, free markets have done a lot of research on what causes happiness, and one of the few variables that actually has a causal link to happiness is economic freedom. As you can see from this, as it turns out, people like to be in charge of their own lives. It makes them happier when they have or more have a higher life satisfaction when they make their own decisions rather than have a government official make the decisions for them. Now let's look at Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka ranks 116th out of 165 nations in economic freedom. Now, I wanted to compare Sri Lanka to Singapore because to some extent, Sri Lanka has the same opportunities given its location, its potential to be both a transportation and a financial hub because of its location. So I wanted to compare Sri Lanka to Singapore, and I also wanted to compare it to Denmark. You often hear people who oppose free markets say, oh, but look at the socialist Nordic uh, nations. They're a great success, aren't they? Well, they are a great success, but they aren't socialist. In fact, leaders of the, the Nordic nations have pushed back hard when they've been called socialists. What's going on in the Nordic nations is that, yes, they have big government, but in every single other area, they're at the top of the class for economic freedom. By our index, Denmark, the poster nation for the Nordic nations, Denmark has the seventh most capitalist economy in the world. So, looking at overall economic freedom, and we all know the great story that Singapore is, Singapore is now number one in the world in economic freedom. Denmark is number seven. If you look next at the size of government, you'll see, yeah, Denmark has a huge government. Singapore has a larger government. And Sri Lanka actually ranks high in size of government. Now, I've had some discussions with people, and there's some skepticism uh, over that. Uh, and that may be founded because there are things that we do not have data to measure, including internationally the number of government employees. And you have a huge number of government employees in Sri Lanka, and we can't put that in our index. Another factor that may be at play here is we look at what's affecting economic freedom today. In other words, your situation right now rather than trying to project into the future. So we don't measure debts and deficits. Money you will have to pay off in the future that will reduce your prosperity and economic freedom in the future, but not a burden you're bearing now. And the other big factor is the only taxation levels that we have international data to measure are income tax. And income tax in Sri Lanka is very low, but as we just heard from the previous speaker, there are a whole bunch of other taxation that uh, interfere. 
Now, I actually think our measure is pretty uh, accurate, uh, despite the skepticism. Uh, I think one of the reasons that people in Sri Lanka feel that government is bigger because it interferes in so many things that don't require money to interfere in. It interferes in uh, the regulatory in environment immensely lowering opportunity. Anyway, I accept that there's some controversy over that, but I don't think there will be controversy over anything else that we have here. In legal system, the most important aspect of economic freedom, Sri Lanka ranks 87th, Singapore 11, and Denmark 12. And one of the interesting things about Nordic nations is not only do they have a good and impartial legal system, but it's one that's very friendly to entrepreneurship, to investment, to free markets. Unfortunately, in gender disparity, and we saw what we saw in an earlier slide, the gap between men and women, boys and girls, in non-economically free uh, markets. And that gap is reflected in Sri Lanka, which comes 91st in equal legal rights related to economic freedom for, men and, uh, for women and men. This, you're, this cuts out half of the population. It's like entering a unicycle in a bicycle race. It's not going to work very well. Uh, sound money, uh, as you would guess, given the recent history, Sri Lanka rates very lowly. Uh, Singapore and Denmark much higher. Trade freedom. This is what I was talking about before and related to the previous speaker's comments. Your regulations, the government's regulations here, and the way they're implemented and enforced cut Sri Lanka off from the rest of the world and the potential to do what the previous speaker was talking about. Out of the 165 jurisdictions that we measure, Sri Lanka comes in 156, right down at the bottom. And that's important in another way. I'm going to talk about corruption a little while. But when you set up a whole bunch of barriers between your nation and the rest of the world, and it's difficult to get anything in or out or done at the border, then my goodness, there's someone to pay off to get things across the border. And these regulations, this, this, these regulatory, official and unofficial barriers are a source of fuel for corruption. Regulation is another source of fuel for the exact same reason. If you have complicated, unclear, discretionary regulations, then there's someone to pay off to get through. Sri Lanka ranks 105th in the world in regulation uh, uncertainty. This is an area that desperately needs reform. Leg labor regulation in particular needs reform. Labor regulation is promoted to help protect workers. In fact, it does just the opposite, except for a privileged few. For example, high hiring costs and the inability to dismiss someone. In other words, the inability to dismiss someone, keep the least skilled, the dispossessed, out of the labor market. If you are unable to lay someone off, if economic conditions decline, or that person just doesn't work out, then you're going to be afraid to hire that person. Now, you'll hire somebody who has a record, who has an education, where you, have a, uh, where you know the past and can predict the future, so it pr protects fine. 
those who are already privileged. The problem is, it means that you aren't going to hire somebody that has a low skill level because it's just not worth the risk. And this creates an expanded informal sector where workers are unprotected and more lowly paid. Few things could do better to generate prosperity in Sri Lanka than improving labor regulations. And I believe there's an effort underway to do that now. And if you move Sri Lanka up from its very low position to a much higher position, you'll see the labor market expand, employment increase, and poverty decrease. Okay, I've been through that. Now, I just want to show you the relationship between economic freedom and prosperity. So Pakistan is 103rd in the world in economic freedom, really close to the uh, bottom. Now, by the way, these ranks are the average over the period 70 to 21. So they will differ somewhat, from, so they will differ from the ranks that you just saw, which are just for the year 2021. So, over, so it's the average over that period, not in a single year, that will determine prosperity. So Pakistan has averaged 103rd over that period and has an income of $1,500 per person. Sri Lanka has averaged 75th over the same period. And you can see that Sri Lanka has declined in economic freedom. You ranked 75th on average, but you're 116th this year. So things have gotten worse rather than better. Sri Lanka's income is $4,400 a year, rounded up. And you can see the higher the level of economic freedom, the higher the income, ending up with Denmark, which averaged 13th over the full period, and Singapore, which averaged 6th over the period. This just focuses on the uh, uh, Asian uh, nations, uh, so you can see the pattern more clearly. And it is interesting. Singapore, as I mentioned, has a much higher level of economic freedom, is one of the highest levels of economic freedom in the world. And Denmark also has a, higher, has a high level of economic freedom. But look at this. In 1960, Singapore started roughly where Sri Lanka is now in per capita GDP but it opened its markets. It became, today, the most economically free nation in the world. And look at that growth rate. So Singapore went from roughly Sri Lanka's average per capita GDP to about $70,000 a year US per person. And I put in Denmark there because even though Denmark has a very high level of economic freedom and has grown rapidly, Singapore's even higher level has enabled Singapore to overtake. I mean, it would be unimaginable to think today in Sri Lanka that you could have an average per capita income of $70,000 per person, but that's exactly what Singapore did, starting from a base of a boat where Sri Lanka is now. I want to turn to corruption, which is a big issue uh, here. As I mentioned before, lack of economic freedom, lack of the, your ability to make your own choices is the raw material of corruption when there's someone to pay off. Corruption is, he is intensely related to lack of economic freedom, and weak rule of law. So on the um, vertical scale is economic freedom. 
And on the horizontal scale is corruption is measured by um, is corruption is measured by Transparency International. And you can see there's an immense, I mean, it's obvious, a huge relationship between economic freedom and lack of corruption. The most economically free nations have the lowest levels of corruption, and that's pretty much without exception. The nations with weak levels of economic freedom, including Sri Lanka, have very high levels of corruption because there's always someone to pay off. And same with the rule of law, where Sri Lanka is also very weak. It's interesting, I've got a trend line in there. Sri Lanka is almost exactly in both instances on the trend line. The exact relationship between lack of economic freedom and corruption. Just gonna quickly go through Sri Lanka's scores. Uh, compared to India, Malaysia, and Singapore. And as you can see, Sri Lanka started out better than India, and India caught up, and Sri Lanka is now uh, going downwards. But of course, that has something to do with your recent economic crisis, size of government, rule of law, sound money, freedom to trade, regulation, labor, oh yeah, labor regulations. Uh, I, uh, a huge disadvantage to the poor and the dispossessed, and Sri Lanka is way at the bottom of our comparison nations there. Um, horrible, horrible for the, pe for the low skilled and the poor. Business regulations. I'm running out of time. I was given 35 minutes and I'm nearly at the end of it. So I wanted to run through that quickly to show you what happens when nations turn to economic freedom, I call them rocket nations. This is perhaps the most interesting to you. The East Asia average of economic freedom, Indonesia, Korean Republic, uh, which as you can see, uh, moved up to second place amongst our sample nations, but wasn't always economically free. And of course, Singapore, at the top. Sri Lanka is green at the uh, bottom, so as you can see, it has amongst our sample nations the lowest level of economic freedom, and in recent years, due to the economic crisis, uh, has gotten even lower. And look what happens, how closely growth is related to economic freedom. Singapore, the fastest growth, as already noted. South Korea, which has a middling high level of economic freedom, not nearly as high as Singapore, but it too is taken off like a rocket nation. Well, those without economic freedom, unfortunately, including Sri Lanka, have, langu have languished at the bottom of the growth uh, charts. Same is true in Western Europe. Ireland was once thought of as an immensely poor nation. Uh, as one, interestingly enough, when Ireland shifted to economic freedom, the unions supported the move. And one union leader told me that it used to be in Ireland, before they opened their markets, that as soon as somebody graduated from a university, and these are almost his exact words, as soon as somebody graduated from a university in Ireland, they took a taxi to the airport to go to the United States or Great Britain because that's where the opportunities were because Ireland, and again, this is a union leader because Ireland had a low level, relatively low level of economic freedom. Well, as you can see here, Ireland undertook a massive reform program supported all across society as noted by including the unions to increase uh, economic freedom there. This is something Sri Lanka could do. And look at what happened. Ireland basically had a lower income than the EU average. And when it shifted in the late 80s and early 90s 
to increased economic freedom, what you just saw, it took off like a rocket ship. It is now one of the richest nations in the world. Same holds in sub-Sahara Africa. Botswana has consistently had the highest level of economic freedom in sub-Sahara Africa. Not in every year, but consistently over time, it is high. Another nation may temporarily jump up, but Botswana is always at the top. Look at the difference. Botswana started out in 1960 as one of the poorest nations in sub-Sahara Africa. About half the average income in sub-Sahara Africa. Sub-Sahara Africa, which as you saw from this chart, lacks economic freedom, is hardly growing at all. But like Singapore, like Ireland, with a high level of economic freedom, Botswana took off like a rocket ship too. Now, you can tell me, well, Botswana has diamonds, and that's just why. Look, lots of sub-Sahara African nations have lots of uh, resources. The Congo is one of the richest places and resources in the world. It's what you do with the resources, which is in part determined by economic freedom. So Botswana took off like a rocket ship. South America, no one is going to particularly like the way uh, Chile moved to economic freedom under a dictatorship. But here we can see Chile move from eh, a low level of economic freedom to the highest in Latin America, where Venezuela, once the richest nation in Latin America, went in the opposite direction. And there are people, I think, who want to adopt pretty much the Venezuelan model here, Bolivian socialism or some sort of Marxism. And this is the disaster that happened. And now Chile has the highest level of income in Latin America while well, people are fleeing Venezuela, which was once by far the richest nation in Latin America. So with the right policies, the future can be bright for Sri Lanka, and it could become a rocket nation. So thank you very much. I have gone 10 seconds over my time, but that's so I appreciate your patience for that. Thank you. Um, so we will now be moving into the panel discussion, and I'd now like to introduce our panelists onto the podium, the, sorry, the stage. Um, as our first panelist, I would like to reintroduce Fred McMohan uh, and invite him back to the stage as well. Um, Fred, I believe he's outside, so we'll just give him a moment for now. Um, I would also now like to invite um, Dr. Harsha De Silva, uh, who began his professional career as a chief economist and treasurer at a leading Sri Lankan bank. Uh, so, Dr. Harsha, please join us on stage. Um, as our second panelist, I would also like to invite Daniel Alphonsus, who was an advisor to Sri Lanka's foreign and finance ministries. Uh, he read philosophy, politics, and economics at Balliol College, Oxford, and public policy at Harvard Kennedy School, where he was also a Fulbright scholar. Um, third on our panel, we have with us again, Thilan Vijay Singh. Um, and finally, on our panel, we have with us uh, Dr. Tom Palmer, who is the Executive Vice President for International Programs at Atlas Network, where he also holds the George M. Yeager Chair for Advancing Liberty. Uh, Dr. Palmer is also a Senior Fellow at Cato Institute, prior to which he was a Vice President of the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. Uh, welcome, Dr. Palmer, and thank you for taking your time to travel um, over here to engage with us. Uh, this panel will be moderated by Rohan Samarajiva, who is the founder of Learn Asia and an advisor to the, ad sorry, to the Advocata Institute. Over to you, Professor. I'm going to privilege, I'm going to give more time for interactive interactions and discussion. Uh, what I'm going to do is ask the two people who have not spoken to essentially, uh, well, there are three people who haven't spoken, uh, but I'm going to ask two of them to present their views in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then get started on questions with uh, questions primarily directed to 
uh, Dr. Harsha De Silva, because he has to leave at 11. Uh, and uh, then we'll go on till about 10.20. Uh, so that's the game plan. Uh, Tom, would you like to get started with, say, about okay. 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I'll be, I'll bet I'll be shorter than that. I've been spending a fair amount of time recently bouncing back and forth between Greece and Ukraine and dealing with uh, the governments there on economic policy. And I think it's an interesting comparison. If you look at Singapore versus Sri Lanka, the, the distinction is quite obvious. But there's pretty, been pretty continuous growth. More interesting to look at countries that experienced staggering crises. So Greece and the Greek economic crises, and then the way that they were hit by COVID, being a very tourism-dependent country, it was a disproportionate hit that the Greeks took. And then Ukraine with the war, uh, the inheritance of a post-Soviet economy, all the corruption, and then the invasion and genocide that is being experienced right now. <clears throat> the fact is, you can recover from a crisis if you get your house in order. And I think Greece is a very good case study of this. They went through the uh, financial crisis, was really devastating to Greece, especially devastating for, to Greece in comparison to other European Union countries. And then they ended up with the center devastated politically, virtually eliminated. And you had the rise of the extremes, populist extremes, on both the left and the right. And when I say populist extremes, I don't mean just like normal, moderate extremes. I mean Maoists, Trotskyists, and Stalinists who formed the coalition of the radical left, and National Socialists or neo-Nazis, anti-Semites, and fascists on the right, Panel and Golden Dawn Party. This was a really terrifying time in Greek political life to see the center eviscerated and the rise of extreme, violent, aggressive, populist parties on both sides. Uh, their policies didn't work. The country continued to stagger. And finally, there was a response, the New Democracy Party, which is a moderate what is called in Europe a center-right policy uh, party, uh, won election uh, quite con uh, 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 convincingly and began implementing the right reforms. So Greece was in a deep fiscal crisis. Their bonds were virtually worthless, uh, government debt, and they began systematically paring back pointless expenditures they brought down their debt-to-GDP ratio from 212%, which is a really kind of staggering number. It's still high. It's much too high. It's about 160%. But the direction of change is extremely important and very positive, and it continues to go down. And they did so while reducing the tax burden on Greeks. So this is a very important point to understand. And here I disagree with some of our green eye shade friends at the IMF, their focus is raise taxes to pay off the loans that we've made. The problem is, you raise taxes, you drive people out of the formal economy. And the Greeks understood this. They lowered the tax burden and they broadened the tax base. They got rid of the complexities of the tax code, the unbelievable number of exemptions and special rates, brought it down to a more fair, even-handed basis, and more people were brought into the tax system. In addition, the digi digitization is palpable. That is to say, you can see the improvement in government services. Uh, such things as driver's licenses, which were very cumbersome. The driver's license was a huge paper document you could not fit in your wallet. It, was, it must have been in, uh, somehow invented in 1905. And they turn it over, it's digital now. They digitized car inspection, a huge number of things. And what you find is the touch points for corruption are eliminated. When I met the Prime Minister Mitsotakis in a previous government, when he was on the way out, he was Minister of, uh, I think, Labor at the time, and he said, you know what I've been doing today, Tom? 
I spent all day with my colleagues eliminating the number of government agencies charged with inspecting your fire extinguisher. There were 11. 11 different agencies that could come into your business and say, do you have a fire extinguisher? Show it to me. We need to test it. So why do we need 11? We understand you should have a fire extinguisher. But maybe one inspector would be enough. But instead, the Greeks got 11. And that meant 11 requests for a little bit of help uh, with the retirement fund of the inspector. They were able to reduce that to one. It's the fire department. They come in, they look, you have a fire extinguisher, it works, you're fine. That's all you need for public health. You don't need 11 of them. Let's turn then to uh, Ukraine, which is still in a very serious crisis, as we know. The Russian invasion is ongoing. Uh, we had, in March of last year, the, uh, anti, the tax reform and anti-corruption summit. And there's a lesson here. It's very important. The Ukrainians have come to understand, as the Greeks did before, corruption is not the cause of the problem, it is the symptom. And this is a very difficult thing to get our heads around. When we see corrupt government officials and the criminality, we want to punish them. Fine, punish them. But that will not solve your problem. If you do not address the cause, you'll just get another group of corrupt politicians. You have to go to the cause. So in Ukraine, they have a, I learned a new word, a new term, tax optimization. Every company pays its own unique tax rate. You optimize, you, you negotiate with the tax authorities. They start out by saying, we're taking 100%, now negotiate us down. And of course, the cronies get very low tax rates, and the non-cronies get taxed to the max. They are, have just pushed through, and it hasn't been formalized by parliament, but it's being introduced, 455 pages of amendments to the tax code. One simple rate, 10%. 10% VAT, 10% personal income, and 10% on uh, distributed corporate profits. That's it eliminate about 27 other insane taxes and bring in more people into the tax system. Currently, the estimate is nearly 60% of Ukrainian employees are paid with an envelope of cash because the tax system is so complicated. Well, as they finally convinced the IMF, they said, look, you tell us raise taxes to pay off the debt. That percentage will just go up. Lower the tax rate, and more people will say, okay, I'll be part of the tax-paying class. One of the insanities of the Ukrainian system, the largest single contributor to the state budget on the tax side is government employees. That makes no sense. You pay them money, and then you take back some as tax. Why? They're the only ones you can catch. Whereas the average employee manages to go around the system. So let me conclude then with a, a thought. What we need to do in Ukraine, and I've been working with our colleagues there, we're hopeful that this will rescue and save the country. In Greece, it worked. And I was involved in 2015 with the Emergency Economic Summit for Greece. Greece now, in 2023, had the record tourist uh, uh, visitations in its history, reached an absolute peak uh, in the last year. Tourism industry is booming. When I was there in 2015, it was shut down. And then the COVID situation, of course, was simply devastating. They are now outperforming the European Union and economic growth. They're outperforming Germany, as an example. And the economist uh, named them the star performer for 2022 and 2023. We'll see what 2024 will bring. But there's almost no question it will bring additional positive economic growth, and the government is now rolling out additional reductions in that oppressive regulatory burden. When that happens, by reducing all these touch points between the citizen, the enterprise, and the state, you are reducing the corruption that 
brings about so much public anger. But if you spend all of your time saying we're going to punish the wrongdoers, you'll fail because you'll just get a new class of corruption in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, the, the general purpose of what I'm doing now is to sort of lay the groundwork so that people have hooks to, to initiate the discussion. Could you lay out your argument in about 10 minutes? Sure. <clears throat> so I'm at the Economic Freedom Summit. And I'm going to focus on one very, very specific aspect of economic freedom, which relates to the mobility of people or labor. And I think there's a couple of ironies that Sri Lanka faces, which is that if you're a Sri Lankan company today, compared to a company based in a much richer country than Sri Lanka, you actually find it much harder to import the talent you need um, in the IT sector, in the tourism sector, Across the, the economy, the companies need specialized talent that they want to bring into the country, but which they find it difficult to do so. It's difficult, A, because if they're not of a particular size, they may not be able to get the necessary quotas. B, even if they're of a particular size, it is just very costly and cumbersome and, and, and takes time as well, and time is money. So that's one irony. The second irony is that if countries much richer than Sri Lanka have a route to becoming a citizen of that country. In Sri Lanka today, there is no way you can become a Sri Lankan. If you marry a Sri Lankan, you live here, you have kids who are Sri Lankans, there is no path to that. And I think even though the economic impact of this may not be massive, at least right now, because we don't have many people who want to migrate here, it could be in the future, A, and B, it characterizes a way of thinking about the migration of labor. And, and this idea of, of a very insular, zero-sum, um, where, where we don't grow together, rather we, we, we protect things uh, that are as they are. So we, we protect the pie, we don't grow the pie. And then the third irony, I think, is countries much richer than Sri Lanka have integrated the, their border systems and allow much freer movement of uh, people and labor. So if you look at the EU, for example, countries like Denmark and uh, Holland and so on and so forth have completely free um, movement of labor with countries like Bulgaria and Romania, which are much, much poorer. Um, or in the case of the United States with NAFTA, there's, it makes it easy for labor to move. In ASEAN, you've got the, uh, the, the ASEAN single market that, again, facilitates the movement. It's not completely free like in the EU. Um, but it facilitates that process. And then if you look at Singapore specifically, since Singapore is being discussed today, uh, just a couple of weeks back, Singapore announced that it will enable QR-based movement between Malaysia and Singapore. They're completely facilitating the process of short-term movement of people across the border and making it as seamless as possible. So in the, these three cases, countries that are much, much richer and have much greater gaps with their neighbors. So we're talking about Singapore, Malaysia, um, the Netherlands, Bulgaria, the US and Mexico. If we compare with our neighbors, for example, in the region, the gaps are much smaller uh, in terms of per capita income. Yet even in these cases, it is much, much uh, easier for, for, for people to move. People are free to move. And so I, I think I want to make, I'd say three points today. The first is, we are just coming out of a crisis. We are still, in a sense, in crisis. We, are, we remain in default. And we need a quick boost to our economy. Tourism is one of the fastest ways we can stabilize. And even in, when it comes to tourism, we place barriers on tourists coming to Sri Lanka. We place barriers in two ways. First is, we make friction. You have to get a visa. You have to sign up for an ETA. You have to fill out 27 form fields, not forms, 27 form fields. You then have to wait for the thing. You have to make a payment using a credit card. Not everyone has a credit card, especially in parts of the world which have moved on to digital wallets. Uh, and, and the payment success rates of these mechanisms are often quite low. So you have at least a couple of percentage points of probably drop-off arising. And if you look at uh, that, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars in foregone revenue here. 
The second is friction in terms of forms, but also in terms of fees. We charge to, uh, to, to get a visa in Sri Lanka. Now, generally, in almost any consumer industry, you try and make the top of the funnel as easy as possible and monetize down the funnel. You get the person into the country, and then you, you provide goods and services and get tax revenue off that services. I had a very rough estimate, back of the envelope. If even 3% of people don't come to Sri Lanka because of the visa fee, it'll cover, um, as, as in, the, the fee will be greater than the tax revenue that they would, the government would have gained. So it doesn't make even sense from a tax point of view, much the less the welfare of people because of the business that's generated. So that's one. Short-term visit visas, tourism, um, is, is one point. The second point relates to labor markets and brain drain. Sri Lanka is losing tons and tons of specialized skills almost on a daily basis, especially over the last couple of years, and it's happening now. So we need to replace some of that talent, and of course we need talent in to help make our current talent even more effective. The second you add someone who is more productive than the average worker in your economy, you're improving your average productivity, one. Two, is such a person is also going to transfer their skills to other people and make the uh, other, uh, other workers more productive. So for example, if you, if you have somebody who, who has a, a particular specialist. Let's say they know how to engage particularly well with, uh, with Japanese investors. The entire team of people working with Japanese investors will be better placed because they have that one resource they can get advice from, and so on and so forth. And, and this relates to skills as well, of course. Then, in addition to that, it's, it's also the case where the whole is greater than its sum of its parts. If we take the, the, the example I just mentioned, a team which has this person um, also works more efficiently as a whole, not only because skills are transferred, but because as a team, they have a co their skills complement each other and can be more effective. So we need to bring this talent in, and we need to make it easy. I think there is no... I, I think the burden of proof is on those who, who, who reject the proposal of offering on arrival, a two-year residence visa for anyone who, has, who comes from a country with a per capita GDP four times that of Sri Lanka. We can discuss the exact threshold, but I think the principle here is what is important. Because if you're from a country that is significantly more productive than Sri Lanka, coming to Sri Lanka probably is a net value addition to our productivity. Uh, and it's a very easy way to help us gain a, uh, higher productivity levels in our economy. So the, really, I think the burden of proof is on those who say, no, we shouldn't do this, and what their argument is. Before I f finish, uh, just a final point on this, and then a, a slightly tangential point, which is just as much as you make it easy for talent to come to Sri Lanka, you need to make it easy for them to work in Sri Lanka. Currently, the restrictions of, of uh, qualification migration is much greater in Sri Lanka than in many rich countries. In the EU, across the EU, people have uh, mutual recognition of, of qualifications. Across the developing world, there are a number of different mechanisms that are used. In Sri Lanka, actually, it's much harder um, to, to get a foreign lawyer, a foreign doctor, a foreign specialist of some sort or the other to, to work here. And that's something that we can change at the stroke of a pen. So again, I would submit that the argument has to be made for those who say we shouldn't do this. And I would say that any country who has a per capita GDP four times Sri Lanka, their qualifications should be recognized in Sri Lanka. Uh, because if they can build a bridge in that country, if they can heal somebody in that country, it doesn't make any sense that they can't practice and work here. And it's, it's really getting quite ridiculous at this point that Singaporean doctors can't practice here when our health minister goes there for treatment. It's, it's really getting quite absurd. So on that note, um, yeah, I, I, I think the time is really here, and the, the, the goalposts have shifted. Those who say that people shouldn't be able to move have to make the case rather than the other way around. You didn't hear the full introduction, Varsha, but I think everybody knows he's uh, a legislator in the opposition. So I want to pose some very specific questions uh, to get some insights from Harsha before he leaves. Now, Tilan's presentation, I found a little interesting section. Like many of us, Tilan was also unhappy about the strategic development projects 
act. But you said that that is tied to para the imposition of para tariffs. So is it possible to get rid of the SDP while the para tariffs are in place, or do we have to to articulate the two? It's a question for both of you, Harsha and Tilan. So Mangala started it, but it was halted. Now it has started again. Uh, but there is a major, powerful lobby uh, to stop that from uh, going through. So as chairman of the committee, uh, it's been a struggle for me because on the one hand, some days they'll send us legislation uh, amendments to remove para tariffs. Then the next day, they'll send something to impose para tariffs. Um, so there is a contradiction in the system. So I have actually been fighting very hard, telling the government, tell me what your policy is. Because I have the secretary sitting here of the Ministry of Finance, another secretary Ministry of uh, Industry sitting there. And they don't see eye to eye. So industries has some other agenda. Finance has another agenda. So one of the reasons that I get hammered sometimes mercilessly in the press is when I try to ask these questions as to what is your policy. So recently something have that happened, I took it to the Privileges Committee also, is that the Industries Ministry wanted para tariffs imposed on a whole bunch of things, uh, whereas just, uh, you know, previous uh, or business was to remove para tariffs of 300 items. So, so there's obvious contradiction, right? So, so there, ha there has to be alignment. Uh, ministries can't have different policies. Paratariff policy is one that has to be articulated by the top and the Ministry of Finance. And once the Ministry of Finance articulates that policy, Ministry of Industries or whoever else it is, Ministry of Health, Pharmaceuticals, whatever, will have to abide by, right? So the issue, Rohan, with the, the SDP Act, as Tilan very correctly pointed out, is there are no real uh, guidelines. Uh, another issue that uh, probably most of you also saw of the video clip when HCL Technologies came for a 16-year tax holiday, and uh, 12 years after that, 50% of uh, ex uh, whatever tax that would exist at the time, I asked a simple question, what is the tax expenditure? And the chairman of the BOI had absolutely no idea. And he said, I'll check with them and come back to you. And I said, you know what? And that, that, that's what happened. And then subsequently he got fired. I also got fired. I got rehired. <laughs> he didn't. But nevertheless, the good thing is the, the IMF has now imposed a condition that the tax expense has to be calculated. Right. Once the tax expense is calculated, then there can be some uh, debate even whether it should be given or not. And another, uh, another recommendation is to you know, sort of you know, clear the regulatory muddle and corruption is that the gasset cannot be imposed unless uh, it is first approved in parliament, which now is the other way around. The gasset is imposed then it gets into, uh, it, it is implemented, and without prejudice, if parliament uh, 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 resolves to take it away, then it stops at that point. You see, so it is not that the, 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 the legislature first approves it and then implements it, it's the other way around, which is kind of crazy. And the last point that I will, I will bring to your attention is who has the power uh, to, to change tax rates or remove or impose taxes or duties or levies? It is the legislature. In the Constitution, Article 148 very clearly says that full powers yep. of public finance lies with the legislature. Now, a recent uh, event has questioned this, uh, the constitutional power uh, where I have actually, you know, stopped this thing from going through is that the Port City Commission uh, listed out about two or three hundred items that would be made duty free 
uh, to be sold at the, the new downtown duty-free complex, which should also have a 25% tax holiday and also no payee, et cetera, no taxes at all, plus duty-free. So my question to the commission was, who made this list? They said, we made the list. I said, who gave you the power to make this list? Well, the parliament has given us authority under the, the Port City uh, Act uh, to, to, to make rules. And with that authority to make rules, we have made a rule, and that rule is whether it be watchers, uh, washing machines, uh, refrigerators, all of these things can be sold duty-free up to $5,000 per year for every Sri Lankan who comes from abroad can go to Chennai and come back, or foreigners who come and want to buy these uh, items without a limit, which, like you said, would create a distortion in the marketplace. Now, then we found out, uh, we read the rules, and rules referred to community rules. I said, that means whether you're coming to my club after 6 o'clock, whether you had to wear uh, collared t-shirts. Now the golf club has a new rule that you can't wear Chinese collar. I mean, those are the types of rules <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that they can, but not remove uh, taxes uh, by uh, sort of writing up their own rules, which created a big uh, you know, complication because the agency has already signed up with uh, operators. Now, what has happened is that is in limbo. So when we wrote to the AG, AG wrote me a four-page letter saying, who gave these people the authority to uh, take out taxes of all these, uh, you know, 200 items. So, they, so we have now uh, directed them to uh, rescind the, the gasset, which they did without coming to parliament. So now that gasset will be rescinded in the next week or so. That creates a sort of a legal business continuity issue uh, that needs to be resolved. So, uh, Rehan, the problem is with this STP. There are no guidelines, and it is under the STP that even the Port City Commission gets its powers uh, to, to remove all these existing taxes. And it is up to the politician to decide how long, right? I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm just referring to these companies because they've been in. You know, it is public knowledge, right? A software company should it be given 16 years tax holiday, right? Or or some other company uh, like uh, Tilan said should it be given 25 years tax holiday? A new uh, logistics company in the port, who decides on what basis? Right? So it, it is utterly complicated, and I totally agree with uh, Tilan that we need to go to a simple uh, and, and very clear, transparent mechanism uh, where these people know what kind of benefits they are getting or not getting. It is not up to the discretion of the politician to decide. So uh, I think that's a very uh, nitty-gritty from the trenchers' view of the kinds of abstract principles that are being discussed here. Uh, Tilan, you have any, any responses to that? No, I mean, very quickly, the, the issue that investors constantly put pressure on governments to qualify for the SDP status, so I have this sanctity of a BOI agreement, is the propensity of governments to constantly keep changing policies and taxes. So they want stability. So there are companies, for example, let's say that it takes them four years to construct. During those four years, para tariffs and taxes are introduced that changes the entire equation of investment. So, so what is the right balance? That, that's why I'm saying it's not a question I can answer in, in a forum of this nature. Let's look at what's prevailing at the moment. Because on one extreme, you can say, okay, we don't need a BOI, we don't need SDP. We are like Singapore, the entire country is a special economic zone. Everything is transparent and open. Are we ready for that as yet? Probably not. And that's the reason for the advent of the BOI law way back in 78, where areas of authority were created under the BOI law where you can waive, modify, exempt, and not apply the municipality-related rules. 
um, I, th I think that we have to gradually migrate to the whole country being, you know, one not even economic zone where anybody can invest anywhere under the same same sort of rules. But at this juncture, when we are coming out of this whole investment morass, I think it's important that whatever laws and rules we frame, that that the changes in law do not re result in you know ad hoc policy changes that impact investor confidence. So that's that's really my my point. So Harsha, I want to get uh, a discussion on uh, movement of people across borders, going with everybody's participation. You want to participate in it or you want to leave? It's eleven. No, I I will just. You want to stay? Yeah, I'll, yeah. Okay. The last one. I'll stay. So one of the most controversial aspects, uh, some of you may know, I've been on the firing line uh, on trade matters, and I get hit the most when I talk about mode four. Uh, services trade, which is law-governed, specified ability for professionals to move between countries, right? And I get hammered, right? Bimal Veeravansa has portrayed me as, I think in the pay of, I don't know which government, I mean, depending on the day, he'll complain that I'm in the pay of some government, right? So now, uh, I'm happy to see uh, another candidate coming up to the firing line, uh, Daniel, so I can retire gracefully. Uh, so the question is, there seems to be some huge emotional power associated with this. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pose a question, a, a case study, and I'm going to ask all of you to react. In Hikadua, there are Russians running businesses. There are Russians who come on tourist visas and who are delivering pizza. Should this be allowed or is this something that should be liberalized or not? I believe that four times rule of yours, the Russians would be, would be so. allowed. Yes. Let's assume that Russians have four times GDP, right? So that's the question. Now I'm going to ask any or all of you to take a run at in terms of whatever the argument that was laid out by Daniel. You want to start, Daniel? Sure. I, I'd argue that they should be able to. I assume that they are doing delivery because they are providing a service that is, is, is somehow um, a value add to somebody else providing a, a delivery. I'm assuming they're not actually on a regular basis doing deliveries. Um, they're running a pizza shop and on occasion they're doing deliveries when the local staff are unavailable. But let's even bite the bullet and say even doing deliveries. Um, that may be because they can communicate with the buyer. Um, so there's a Russian tourist. They're placing a pizza order on their phone. And they need to give directions on where to uh, deliver the product. Because as a business owner, why would you pay X amount more to a Russian in Sri Lanka than you would pay to a Sri Lankan? It's because you see you're able to charge a higher price. And, uh, that basically means you're providing a value-added service. So I think there's no issue at all um, with, with uh, a, a Russian delivering pizza in Sri Lanka. Anyone the, else the only, want to join? Only Dilan. Issue, only as long issue. as they pay tax. Exactly what I was going to say. The only issue is that they're not getting caught up in the tax net because we have a, I don't want to call it a ridiculous, but a rule that says that um, you have to bring, what, one million dollars to open a mom and pop shop for anybody getting into retail. Um, and then there was a provision what is, on what is called Section 16 of the BOI law, which should be automatic. In other words, you, are, you have an automatic window through which where you don't have to sign an agreement to enter into a business here, which is not on some negative list. You can't manufacture arms, you can't do drugs or whatever the case may be. But that negative list should be understood very clearly. And if you're in that automatic route, uh, many years ago, there, there was a monetary limit of $50,000. So during my, the time I was at the BOI, I was criticized that there are Chinese-owned acupuncture centers coming up, which are functioning as potentially brothels. The point is, they did qualify to set up a, a Chinese medical facility, but if any, any one of those are breaking the law, the land, law, law, the land should apply. So the point is that, to me, the automatic route should very, be very clear and they should be allowed to incorporate a company, get caught up in the tax net and, and run a business and compete with all of us. Okay, Tom? 
Well, it's for me a little bit controversial because I come in a country where Russians come to murder you <laughs> and uh, wipe out your villages, but the Russians coming here don't do that. And I, I would question one small point on the GDP relationship because Russia is a state-dominated petro economy. The private economy is quite small in Russia, the actual productive economy as opposed to a state-owned extractive economy. So it's probably a little bit more comparable. If you go to rural Russia, it is staggeringly poor country. But because of the dictatorship there, 700,000 qualified Russians have left. Wow, what an opportunity for Sri Lanka because these are people in IT, finance, engineering, and so on. Uh, there's an opportunity there for countries that are open to But import. notice that I talked Sorry? about pizza delivery. Well, trust me, everything across the board, and even having an IT <coughs> person coming to deliver pizzas might be getting more income than they were getting in Russia, which is the option of going to prison at the moment, but they are going to enrich your economy. There's just no question about it. Okay, any other responses? Yes, Harsha? I remember delivering pizza as an undergraduate, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> delivering pizza is a very respectable job if you're a kid. But um, my point is, I, I don't necessarily agree with Daniel on that times four uh, formula. Um, I think it has to be um, sort of a more at, at an individual level. So you, you need to apply and then, you know, you need to meet certain criteria. Um, so I am not for completely opening uh, based on GDP, but I'm certainly uh, open to discussing how we can find a way because this problem needs to be resolved. And, uh, you know, know-how comes, all of that comes in, 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 in when you bring uh, uh, talent here. Um, so that's that's where, where I am. I'm not open for the uh, sort of time so yes. times for sort of right. start. Can but I just, quickly just a minute, to just to clarify, uh, the trade agreements route, where in the schedule we can specify, is close to where Harsha wants to go, right? We can specify this many professionals, this many managers, uh, salary levels, etc. Not the kind of open liberalization that you're talking about. So that's the one that I'm getting crucified for, right? For the trade agreement. So I can tell you, your life is going to be much harder. Can uh, I quickly respond to Harsha? On quickly. The, um, so two points on that. One is, if the threshold were 10x, would you accept it? Second question is, in a conditions where state capacity is weak, you're anyway going to have a lot of false positives mm -hmm. using your method. So the question is, are the false positives greater on a 10x or the false positives greater on a discretion based on, based on criteria, but there's still a subjective element there. And I would submit that with our state capacity and current levels of corruption, actually uh, a, a threshold of X, whatever that X may be, actually will have fewer false positives than an individual case-by-case -case entry basis in aggregate. Well, I don't, to bring that well, or, I don't necessarily yes. agree. I, I expect government, governance to get better. I expect digitalization and all that coming in to reduce the discretionary power of customs officials to grant a person a visa uh, based on some you know, payment, payment under the table. So I'm going to go on that assumption that I'm hoping this country will get better. Once you do that, I'm not in favor of the X. I'm in favor of uh, 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 individual application uh, that ought to be uh, evaluated. That's how it happens. I th I'm not sure you've been researching this, Daniel, but whether it is in Singapore, whether it is in America, whether it is in Australia, New Zealand, I think it's the individual. I don't know how it works in uh, EU or, or Mexico that you meant, whether anybody can just come in. Uh, so uh, particularly in this country, given the, the ecosystem that exists, the socio-political structure that we got to deal with, you know, it, it, I'm just saying what could be practical. Fred, last comment. I very like to the totality of barriers that separate Sri Lanka from the world, which are not just travel barriers, but barriers for everything. I had a marvelous conversation with a very talented gentleman during the coffee break who runs projects uh, here. 
was telling me about a building project where his costs for raw materials like steel and concrete were 50, 40, 30 percent above the market costs, uh, above the market price of those things. And that's because of the various trade barriers that Sri Lanka has enacted and the corruption of getting things across the border. So just imagine, yes, you need people, but you also need concrete, you need steel, uh, you need many components. So just imagine what a barrier that is, not just to trade, but to Sri Lanka's future prospects. It cripples Sri Lanka businesses because the costs uh, are out of control due to these barriers. It means foreign investors, which are a great uh, strength, uh, which are a great driver of economic activity, have little incentive to come in. This gentleman was telling me that, his that the buildings in Sri Lanka per square foot cost more than building in the developed world itself. Why come to a place where it's more costly to build here than in Vancouver, uh, Canada, because the barriers make it more expensive. A huge thing, it's not just people, it's all this, all these barriers that are choking Sri Lanka's ability to grow. Now, we have 15 minutes to the end. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Yes, can you get a mic to this gentleman? Ah, you have. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to thank every, um, all the panel for a very um, deep and erudite uh, dissertation. Um, I, I have to plead guilty to uh, the building project. Um, you can see it out of the window. But what I want... We have only 15 minutes. I would yeah, plead I, with you to yeah, what I want compress to it and have a question. Okay, what I want to say is, is, is somewhat complicated. I was at the Gaul Literary Festival and fortunate enough to meet Frank Copan and Mary Beard. And history, as you well know, for the longest time, was the story of powerful white men working their way on the system. You know, when I listen to this discussion, I think we are not talking enough about the systems. You know, Mr. Uh, De Silva has a certain panacea. Uh, Tilan, you have a, 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 a very analyzed thing. The system is absolutely crap here. It's broken beyond belief. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a Canadian Sri Lankan, and I can see the JVP on the horizon. You know, I think what we need is um, a cultural change. Um, if, if you buy a company, you can fix the balance sheet, but until you get, uh, 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 until you do social engineering, you're not going to go anywhere. That's what we need here, and my suggestion for social engineering is, let's have some pilot projects around the country, say up north and all that, where uh, all these holidays don't uh, apply, the labor laws don't apply, because I think it's too big a change to try and impose on the country. You know, um, it's a sort of BUI idea, but widened beyond numbers. Thank you. Right. So the idea that instead of doing countrywide reforms, we do zones. I mean, we did develop tourism that way. We did the BUI zones that way. And when I was asked to comment on the port city, I said, because the BUI model hasn't worked, we are now creating it for the service industry. Same one-stop shop, single window, that whole idea. So what is the response to that question? Um, yeah, so that was the original idea of the Port City Law, was for it to be a special economic zone, and this was not the current law that is implemented at the moment, which is a, a aberration of the original vision, um, was to make it a policy lab for introducing yeah ease of doing business policies and procedures and then rolling it out in the rest of the country yeah. so that you and that can need not be limited to port city it can be limited to i mean that's the reason i'm advocating why the port city uh, bui law should be expanded to being a special economic zone law and that is not intended to you know deprive this uh, nation of taxes it just to gradually take us to the higher echelons of the ease of doing business index so yes uh, 
but the but the version of the law that we have at the moment you know is 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 not the uh, uh, it, as i mentioned i don't want to get into that subject but it needs to be relooked at so very, very quick point about this cultural context uh, cultures change much more rapidly than we think along the margins that are important to us i was in pakistan years ago and a uh, very distinguished imam spoke uh, on this question he says Pakistanis are not honest. We all know that. Dishonesty, corruption is rife here. But he says, you take a Pakistani business person who's paying bribes and being corrupt in Pakistan, flies to England, shows the passport, steps across, and stops being corrupt. Why? He's still the same Pakistani. It's because the context is different. It's the rules are different. He didn't change. So you like zones or not? Well, in some sense, the problem with proliferating zones is you end up with a, a complex legal structure, and people will game it. I'd much prefer same rule for everyone as the default. I understand the role, especially economic zones, but the default should be everyone gets the same rule. So I'll give you one last example of a transformation of culture that took place in about three months. The Georgia, Republic of Georgia, was the most corrupt post-Soviet state, which is saying a lot. <laughs> the police were just criminals. They would stop you and just demand money from you. So everyone carried two wallets, the bribery wallet and the real wallet. They fired the policemen, instituted a new rule. Policemen had a new uniform. They, fired, they hired all new police force. The requirement was, you've never been a policeman before. They got them proper police training, different uniform, different automobiles. And then they bulldozed the police stations and built ones of glass. They used to take you in and beat you in the police station. Now everyone has a cell phone. Within three months, they went from one of the most brutal, corrupt, really warlord states in the post-Soviet area to a moderate rule of law state not perfection, but the transformation was stunning. And this was a three-month Forgive me, Tom, I do not believe this happened in three months. You can't hire new people, you can't train them, you can't build new police stations made of glass in three months. The police stations took longer. So it's that, like once all that was done, it took three months for the results to show. Not quite. It was a three-month period to institute the new police force. So that was three months of training, getting Danish police trainers and so on. The changing of the police stations took longer. It turns out blowing up police stations is time consuming <laughs> and then building new glass ones. So that was over about a two and a half year, right. three year period. So I'd like everybody to think about this time question because I think there were some very, uh, I would say to this audience, very attractive proposals about a 10% tax, which most of the people here would love, love to, to pay. Uh, instead of uh, the 20, 30 percent that we are paying now, uh, nobody is paying 36, by the way. Huh? Uh, so, you know, all of these things, there's a time scale issue that a lot of people don't take into to account when they discuss. Your question, madam. Um, actually, it's not a question. I'm Shiranti. Just sharing thought as a strategy, free movement of people is essential for economic freedom. But the country needs to have a skills acquisition framework. Even Malaysia, Singapore, like they insist that the uh, skilled migrants have local language like Bahasa Malaysia. So we need to have a language NVQ level for the temporary work permit. Maybe, you know, e ease up the rules, but have a NVQ level so that the conversations become, uh, you know, in local language. Otherwise, the system rejects. Uh, so so you're saying a, a Singapore doctor coming here will have to speak singular? Uh, I'm just saying some NVQ le level for, I'm not saying the upper crust, right? Mid, mid supervisory level, technicians, uh, craftsmen, tradesmen, people, which we need are ah. also like NVQ <laughs> skills that can come into the country. Uh, I do not see much difference of Russian IT professionals uh, delivering pizza versus Sri Lankan doctors being dog workers in London. The only difference is UK has a tax system. They pay tax. We don't. And these become informal workers. And if they are operating in down south before long, they can be contracted to do other uh, below the line illegal activities as well. 
uh, you know, given the status of our country right now. Now, the strategy is You said you don't have a question, but I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. I'm wrapping it up. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast. What we need to do is while we roll out the strategy, engage the unions, engage the political parties, otherwise the strategy will get ripped apart in political stages. Uh, we take pilots. Uh, if you look at Sri Lankan Airlines, foreign pilots are paid in a higher uh, pay scale, and there's dissension there. You get cricket coaches. What happened to Mickey Arthur and his entire team? They got kicked out because the team huddles. The players started saying, we don't understand English. So diversity of talent is good, but inclusion strategy and inclusion uh, through engagement becomes really essential for economic freedom. Right. Reactions from the panel? So I think the point is very well made, but the question is state capacity. We have a state which can't train its own civil servants to speak in the two national languages. We have a state who, in the case of most English teachers, can't even speak English properly. So in this context, I think it's a bit much to really try and tell the market what to do. The market is anyway going to respond if somebody can't speak the, the language of the consumer. That, that will be reflected in the price of that labor. So I think we should let the market handle this for now until the state develops bigger capacity to start interfering in all these things. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's on labor regulation and the link with economic freedom, which I think is very valid. My question is to Mr. Vijay Singh. Uh, you've attracted so much foreign investment to the country when you were at the BOI. How did you sell the Termination Act? Because I have dealt with this ease of doing business. Uh, the, one of the main stumbling blocks is the Termination Act. Now, we are in a situation, we are looking at um, amending the labor law, replacing 13 acts, including the Termination Act. But it's getting whittled down, and it's slower. And due to the economic climate, I don't think it's going to happen. So how did you sell it? Sell the country despite that? And the second one is, since you had such a good relationship with, uh, I mean, you were able to change the BOI board, why didn't you persuade Mrs. Kumar and Tunga to get rid of this act? Because her mother brought it in. You had a wonderful opportunity to get rid of it. Thank you. <laughs> um, quick answer was that when I took up office, within months, the government wanted to introduce a workers charter. And I took one look at it and went to Ramani, what's her ILO, I forget her last name. Uh, 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 Gunanthi Lekha. Ramani because I didn't know much about labor law. I got her to teach me everything there is about labor law. And I decided that the Employment Termination Act is the lesser of the evil. Because there are, and I pushed, I, I can't remember whether I had any role to play in that, but, but to make sure that there were formula in, introduced in the Termination of Employment Act, so that it is fairly clear that if a a, a worker has worked X number of months or years, there is a particular formula that is applied. And in private sector positions of companies, I've been managing director of, I have used the Termination of Employment Act in one particular company to reduce the staff by 26% at all levels, senior to uh, labor level, without a hint of a strike. So it does work uh, as far as the Termination of Employment Act. But I wrote a discourse with the help of Ramani against the workers' charter, and highlighting some refinements to other laws, which CBK took note of, circulated to the cabinet, and that killed the workers' charter. So, so the point is that we need to engage with the government and educate them and, 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 and ensure. But, but, but to me, I don't have a problem with the Termination of Employment Act. At that time, at least. I don't know whether, whether and I'm talking 2008-10, uh, I've applied the, applied the law. So, so I'm not an expert, but I leave it at that. Right. So I believe we are at the end of the one hour. I've been given signals that we should wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the, to the panel. I think we've managed to have a decent discussion. Uh, thought has been provoked, even if I don't agree with the 10% tax rate, which is an immediate problem that we have, which is, I think, uh, for our foreign guests, we have to tell you that when we have to give salary increases to our government servants, they have been demanding salary increases. There are three ways to get the money. One is from taxes. The other is by, you know, colloquially, printing money, monetary financing, which is no longer possible. The third is to take loans from somebody. And that is also not possible. So we have an immediate cash flow problem in this country, 
which would make your 10% proposal somewhat unrealistic at the present time. Given that order. in 20, uh, just for your information, in the years 2020 and 2021, of the totality of all the tax revenues, totality, that is income, uh, corporate uh, income taxes, personal income taxes, taxes on foreign trade, and value-added taxes, various kinds of excise taxes, 86% went to salaries and pensions. 86%. There was nothing left. Right? Now it's down to 50 because we have raised the taxes. So I have to see, I have to unfortunately tell you the basis for my, my uh, disagreement on the tax question. At least in the short term, we have a serious cash flow problem in government. We've had it for a long time, but it's extraordinarily serious right now. So with that, can let's I, wrap Ron, up. Can I, can I you want to respond? One, one quick point, while you were talking, I just received a text message on a point that you mentioned where an investor who's been a business partner with me in four or five businesses, including in, in, in Ceylon Tea Trails with Dilma, he has just been told by the BOI that the level of Defense Ministry approval for his visa extension at the DEO level is not sufficient and there's another approval level required and this is a man who has invested in this country for 25 years and that really gets me. Unless we stop the corruption in the immigration department, I'm sorry this country doesn't have hope. Right. Okay. There are action items, plenty, from this morning. I hope our government officials here will take notice of it. I hope others will also take notice of it. And let's get something done. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to Dr. and Professor Samarajiva and the panel for that wonderful and engaging discussion. And thank you so much for listening to us and putting in your questions as well. Um, so we now come to a close of the morning session of this summit. Uh, we'll now be moving on to, into the audit. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining this morning, this morning session of the, the opening of Sri Lanka's Economic Freedom Summit 2024. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and uh, we will see you hopefully at the evening session. Thank you.